Re Blood and Iron by Zent Mr. TTS by Mr. Lightnoff. Chapter 1 Reincarnation. Idiaris's inverted question mark not through speeches and majority decisions will the great questions of the day be decided, but by iron and blood. By Otto von Bismarck. Karl sighed heavily after reading this quote from a historical text displayed on his phone. He instantly shut down the device and stared out the window of the bus, which he used as daily transportation to and from work. In the modern era, Germany's place in the world was different than it had been in the past. It was no longer a great military power, one which would take the combined efforts of the entire world to bring down. Rather, it had become a wealthy and industrious nation. One which was at the head of an economic and political entity known as the European Union. But with its repeated defeats in the prior century, it was Karl's belief that the German nation and the people within it had lost something great. Something unique to their culture that would never again return to this world. And as much as that may pain him, his beliefs were a minority in this new era. In his youth, he had decided to take up the path of his ancestors and enter the German military, the Bundes, which it was now known as. While he had some minor combat experience in Afghanistan, in his old age, he now knew that waging wars on behalf of foreign interests, and those of international corporations was not an honorable experience. These days he was well past the age of fighting, and was instead employed as an instructor at the Bundes Command and Staff College where young officers were forged into capable leaders and hopefully one day generals. Today's lecture was one of unimportance. Why would anything he had to say really matter? Germany was well behind the other major powers in terms of military capabilities. And though Russia had been making aggressive moves in the east, it seemed like a mere fantasy that a global war would break out with them, one that would involve the mobilization of the Bundes. It was with these thoughts heavy on his mind that Karl sat on the bus, waiting for it to arrive at his stop. But something was wrong. The bus appeared caught in an unusual amount of traffic. With no signs of moving forward. He was just about to get out of his seat and asked the driver what the commotion was when the sound of automatic gunfire echoed from not too far away. Automatic weapons? Here in Hamburg? There was only one thing this could possibly mean. The muscles in his body, which had become largely atrophied with old age, and a lack of training suddenly sprung into action. Years of combat experience in the global war on terror propelled the man forward and out of the bus. He may not have a gun nor even a knife on him. But he could not sit idly by while innocent people were massacred. Screams rang throughout the air, some blood curdling, others filled with terror. And yet the echoes of automatic fire continued to drown them out. Eventually, Carl rounded the corner and found the source of the commotion. A small group of men, armed with ak pattern rifles and wearing distinctive headscarves were shouting in Arabic as they fired into the crowded streets of Hamburg. Allahu Akbar! In years past, such an event would be almost unthinkable, but due to Germany's lax migration laws, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of military-age migrants had flooded the country, and Europe in general. Terrorism was just part and parcel of living in a big city as was famously quoted by the former mayor of London and Hamburg was no exception to this rule. But this did not strike fear into Karl's heart, rather what he felt in this moment was a sense of cosmic irony. Despite decades serving in the German military, not once had Karl been given the opportunity to actually defend the fatherland and its people. Now in his old age, with a broken down and weary body he was given a chance. A chance to do something that would honor his ancestors. While rounding the corner. It became abundantly clear that one of the terrorists was holding a young woman hostage. No, she was not a young woman, but an adolescent girl. That was a far more accurate descriptor. Knowing that the police had yet to arrive at the scene of this attack, and were likely moments away, Carl felt compelled to act before this young girl could be killed, or worse. He quickly jumped out from behind the corner and attacked the nearby terrorist who held the young girl hostage. Doing so, by grabbing hold of the terrorist from behind, instantly putting him in a neck crank. An act which shocked the man, as he was not expecting an attack. Before he could fire his weapon, 
Carl utilized every ounce of his strength and the old combat techniques he had learned in the army to break the man's neck. The man fell to the floor, along with his victim, but unlike the terrorist, she was still breathing. Before Carl could make another move, a burst of gunfire rang throughout the air, and he realized by the stinging sensation in his chest that he had been hit by one of the other two men. Using his last ounce of strength, Carl screamed at the young girl to run as his legs buckled beneath him. Go. Save yourself. The girl ran off, not even giving a second glance to the middle-aged man who had saved her. Nor a simple thank you. But none of this mattered to Carl. The corruption of the youth, and their lack of concern for anyone else was just a symptom of much larger problems with this cruel world. He would rather die an honorable death here and now, defending his people, than to continue wasting away in a meaningless life, for a future that was void of any hope or happiness. His last thoughts were about how bitter he was towards this world, and its current degenerate state. This fucking world. Bang utter darkness enveloped Carl. He could not speak, nor could he scream no matter how much he wanted to. But there was something else he noticed as he lied there. There was no pain where he had been shot. Was he alive, dead, or waiting to be judged for his sins in life? He had no idea. Nor did he really believe such things were true. If God really existed, then Carl was owed dearly for the suffering he had endured in this pitiful and meaningless existence. And as if his prayers were suddenly answered a light began to be revealed at the end of the tunnel of darkness. Instinctively, he crawled towards it only to find himself blinded by the overwhelming illumination of the outside world. Or was it something else? Either way, he had no idea where he was, or what was happening. His only hint was the voice of a man in the background. It's a boy. Congratulations my lady. Without any control over himself, Carl was soon given to his mother after his umbilical cord was cut. He could barely make out her facial features as his new mother clutched him to her chest with a warm and loving smile on her wary face. It was only after experiencing this jarring sensation that Carl came to the realization that he had been well and truly reborn. Perhaps if he had a proper clarity of vision, then Carl would notice that things were not as he expected them to be. He was not in a hospital, as he was experiencing a rebirth but rather a luxurious bedroom of what was clearly a residence. Not only that, but the D.A. tilde copyright core was antiquated. It would have been fashionable a hundred years ago, or perhaps longer, but not in the modern day. And then there was the staff. Nurses and maids attended to the lady of the house and her newborn son. They did not look like they themselves were dressed appropriately for the 21st century, which he had died in. Just what was going on? Then the mother forced Carl to look her in the eyes. She was tired, obviously so having just been through labor pains for several hours. But she gave the boy a name before being carried off to be taken care of by his wet nurse. My son. From this day forth you shall carry your father's name, Bruno. Carl, or Bruno as he was now known, was carried off as his mother drifted into sleep. Without his father in sight, he was soon taken to rest in a crib where a pretty young woman spoke to him. Her words were the last thing he would remember of his rebirth before he himself lost his consciousness. Young Master Bruno, you have been afforded the highest honor of being born the ninth son of the von Zeipner family. Having been named after your esteemed father, I have no doubt you will accomplish great things in life. Rest now. Idiaris's inverted question mark five years had passed since Bruno's rebirth in this new world and it became immediately apparent to him that he was no longer in the 21st century, which he had perished in prior to reincarnation. Curiously enough, he had been born before the folly and wrath of a bygone era. One that would permanently change the fate of Germany from a mighty empire to yet another subordinate state of globalism. The year of his rebirth was 1879, a full eight years after the unification of the German Empire. Though the German people were finally united, it was a time of economic downturn. One that would last until the 1890s. Despite this, Bruno was fortunate insofar as he was born the ninth son of a minor noble house within the Kingdom of Prussia, 
one that possessed significant wealth due to their status as war industrialists. This house, despite being forged less than a century ago during the wars of Napoleon, had become quite wealthy as they had a talent for engineering machines of destruction which were purchased and employed by the German army. Bruno's father was a wealthy and busy man. He had connections to the military as a former officer himself, as well as the politicians in the Reichstag, making him fairly important in the society that Bruno found himself in. This meant that he was seldom home, or capable of spending time with his newest son. As for his brothers, the oldest was already nearing the end of high school, where he would soon ship off to the Prussian military academy, as was tradition in the von Zeibner family. After all, they were founded in the heat of battle, and so, too would their sons experience the same. Whereas the youngest of Bruno's older brothers was only two years ahead of him in age, he had no sisters to speak of, and because of this, if he wished to one day become the head of the house, he would have a long and vicious battle ahead of him. But Bruno had much larger ambitions. Rather than be the head of a minor German noble household, his goals were to prevent the fall of the German Reich in 1918, and instead ensure its dominance in the century to come. And it was because of this that he decided to live out the early days of his childhood to the best of his ability. And that meant that Bruno spent the majority of his time studying everything he could within the manor's library. Very early on in his new life, Bruno had proven himself capable of walking, talking, reading, writing, and performing basic feats of arithmetic well before a young child should have the means to do so. This was not necessarily because he was born with any greater degree of intelligence, but rather because he maintained the memories of his past life. Still, it was shocking to the family. From their perspective, an unparalleled genius had been born into their house. And this was only further proven so, as Bruno's display of knowledge increased with each passing year. Especially as the young child began to read every book in the family's library. But such exceptional feats at such an early age had its drawbacks. After all, his mother had a tendency to speak frequently and boastfully about her beloved youngest son's exceptional talents, which were multifaceted and continued to expand with age. While this would create large expectations for his future by many powerful figures in German society, it also created many enemies for the boy, not only among the scions of the other noble families within his own age group, but especially among his brothers. Despite only being five years of age, Bruno frequently found himself the victim of bullying and harassment, of which the most common perpetrator was the youngest of his older brothers, Ludwig. Ludwig was a normal child perfectly average in every way aside from the position of his birth. And he was deeply envious of the special attention and praise that his younger brother, Bruno, received from both of their parents, as well as their instructors, which commonly manifested itself in temper tantrums. Today was no exception. Ludwig had tripped Bruno as he was walking out of the family manor's library, and towards his own personal quarters, while carrying a stack of books. The texts which contained knowledge that would be considered quite advanced for Bruno's current age scattered on the floor. Meanwhile, Bruno himself received scratches on the top of his knees. The pain was mild to Bruno, who in his past life had been shot multiple times even before his death. But it was the disrespect that caused him to dust himself off, and walk past his brother with a cold look in his sky-blue eyes. This act of complete and total indifference towards him only further enraged Ludwig. It wasn't just the way that Bruno was better than him at everything that so aggrieved the young child. But it was the way that the boy would brush off every attempt in which Ludwig would make to express his fury. Because of this, Ludwig got in Bruno's way, and pushed him to the floor violently once more. Only for Bruno to rise to his feet for a second time without the slightest care. Once more dusting himself off, as he tried to walk past Ludwig and defuse the situation. Showing such lack of care for his elder brother's petty and childish attempts to hurt him may be the mark of a mature individual, which was something his mother would praise him for. But to Ludwig it was a simple act of contempt, and because of this he grabbed hold of Bruno's collar and began to scream at him while raising his fist. You little bastard! 
You think you're so great? Well, let me show you. However, before Ludwig could strike his younger brother, a servant came rushing towards the both of them from down the hall. She had not seen the two noble scions scuffle, but rather she was here for another purpose. And the moment she entered the area, Ludwig backed off, not willing to get caught bullying the prodigal son. He acted as if he was friendly to Bruno the entire time. Rushing towards the woman who had been both of their wet nurse as if demanding a hug. Helga. The woman named Helga however ignored Ludwig, running past him, where she knelt down in front of Bruno. There was a serious look in her eyes. It wasn't anything grave, or concerning, but Bruno had by now long since memorized the expression the woman would make whenever the master of the house would personally request her to come find him. And sure enough, those were the words she spoke. Young Master Bruno, your father has tasked me to come fetch you. He has an important announcement to make to you. Come this way, quickly. Ludwig was pouting when he saw that Helga had ignored him once more for the sake of his little brother. Apparently, she noticed this as she was holding on to Bruno's hand and ushering him forward. She called out to the older of the two siblings and assured him he would make time for him later. I'm sorry young Master Ludwig, but your father's orders are absolute. I will have to play with you some other time. And with that said, Ludwig's attempts to bully his younger brother were well and truly crushed. At least for the time being. Bruno entered his father's study. And was surprised to find that the man was not alone. Rather, not only was his mother by the man's side, but there was another family standing across from them. A middle-aged man dressed in a heavily embellished military uniform stood by his father's side. Along with him was a beautiful woman, no doubt in her early twenties, who was wearing a lavish dress. And in between the two of them stood a young girl who appeared a year or two younger than Bruno. As someone who had been properly raised with noble etiquette, Bruno immediately bowed before his father and the Prussian general while announcing his presence. Noble father, general, I have come to find you as requested. If it pleases you both, may I know what this is about? The middle-aged man, dressed in a Prussian general's uniform twirled his finely groomed and waxed imperial moustache as he gazed upon Bruno, and his manners. The man was clearly giving an approving nod to Bruno. Almost as if he was surprised by the boy's proper display of noble etiquette. As for Bruno, he kept his head bowed until he was given permission to return to a proper standing position. But before such a thing could be granted, the general shifted his attention back to the boy's father, where he spoke to the man who went by the same name as his youngest son. Lord Bruno, is this the child? The young prodigy I have heard so much about? The house which Bruno hailed from was one generally regarded as being junkers, though they were full-fledged nobility. The gaze which the middle-aged man shot towards Bruno's father was filled with contempt. No doubt this man was from the old nobility, and if Bruno had to guess he was from a family which earned their status during the medieval period, when grants of land were given in accordance with feudal responsibility. This was in contrast to Bruno's family, which had earned their noble title less than a hundred years ago via merit in combat. To an ancient noble family, like the middle-aged general was from, Bruno's family were mere upstarts ones whose power and influence in the Reich was unfitting of their lacking heritage. As for the young girl standing in front of her father, she was a shy and skittish creature. The moment Bruno entered the room, she hid behind her mother and peered out from behind as if she had just seen something frightening. She, like Bruno had fine golden blonde hair and light as your eyes. Her long and silky hair was tied into twin braids. If Bruno actually had the mind of five years old, he might have developed a crush on the young doll like a girl at first sight. But Bruno had barely taken notice of the girl, or her unusual behavior. He had no interests in such things. After all, though his body was that of a five-year-old boy, it held the memories of a man well past his fifties. How could he possibly care about a young girl such as this? It was because of this that Bruno would never have anticipated the words which the general would speak next. The boy's manners are quite good, considering his heritage, and I see no imperfections to speak of. You have raised this boy quite well. I have decided you will marry him to my youngest daughter. 
I diaresis inverted question mark Bruno had an expression which matched that on his father's face. He was astonished by this proposal. Sure, it was common knowledge that engagements were made between noble families throughout history and in many cases the parties involved were quite young when they first occurred. But he was the ninth son of a junker nobleman from a family whose nobility was less than a hundred years old. Why would this general, who clearly looked down on his family, propose such a thing? Unless, sure enough, just as Bruno began to suspect that there was some hidden meaning behind this engagement his father's expression shifted. At first, the man was shocked, and he had every right to be, as he knew more about the circumstances behind the offer than his son did. But when the Lord finally recovered his senses, he could not help but clench his teeth and curl his fists. It took every ounce of the man's strength to compose himself, as he knew the consequences of behaving recklessly here and now would be dire. He then posed a question to the middle-aged general, who was sneering at him while twirling his moustache as if the Lord's reactions were something to take great enjoyment in. Your Grace, am I to understand that you intend to betroth the daughter of your mistress to my true-born son? It suddenly hit Bruno when he heard these words. This little girl was a bastard. It made sense when he thought about it at greater length. I mean why would a middle-aged man have such a young bride, unless of course it was either a second wife, or a mistress. And this would also explain the timid nature of the girl, who was practically shaking as she hid behind her mother. Bastards were seldom treated as family by the nobility, and were often bullied and harassed by their siblings far more than the likes of which Bruno had endured these past few years. A hint of pity appeared in the boy's blue eyes as he gazed upon the timid rabbit who was being sold off to his family, and for no less tragic reasons. Though Bruno suspected there was more to this offer than met the eye. Perhaps there was still some hidden meaning behind it. With this in mind, Bruno shifted his gaze to his father and mother both of which looked like they were just about to throw the prince and his family out of their house for daring to hurl insults at them within their own home. But somehow, they found the strength within themselves to remain calm. Judging by the fact that his father had used the term your grace to deal with this general, the middle-aged man was likely a duke. Or perhaps a mediatized prince. Bruno would later find out that his assumptions were correct and the general was indeed a prince from the ancient and high noble family von Bentheim of whom had been raised to the status of princes by King Frederick William III in 1817. But at this moment, what type of noble this man was, insofar as their exact title, if they still held control of their ancestral lands, or for how long they had held such a lofty position Bruno did not know but he did not have time to think about these matters as the middle-aged prince quickly responded to the Lord's statement. Oh? What is this? You and your lovely bride seem so offended by my offer? You should be honored that I am willing to marry my daughter into a family with such a lacking heritage. She may not hold my name, but my blood runs through her veins. Perhaps some actual noble blood will do you up jumped peasants some good, don't you think? Now the man was no longer even hiding his insults. And Bruno knew his father's breaking point was near. Because of this, he sighed internally. If his father insulted a prince, and a general in the imperial army no less, the consequences would be severe for their family. Sure the von Zeipner family in this timeline may hold a bit of wealth, and a fair degree of influence within the military and Reichstag. But to compare their family to this prince, it was like comparing a lieutenant's power to that of a field marshal. No doubt if the Lord acted without decorum here, it would be catastrophic to his family's future. And because of this, Bruno stepped forward. Fully willing to be the sacrificial lamb for the sake of his family and his own personal future. Apologies for my interruption but I would like to express my opinions on the matter. If that is acceptable to you, your grace. Bruno's father eyed him carefully. The boy was exceptionally intelligent and mature for his age. But to intervene now, and address the prince and not him. There was very clearly some kind of scheme going on in his little mind. The man wanted to interrupt his son from making a mistake, but he was too slow to do so. The prince raised his brow and gazed upon Bruno as if he were a truly unique specimen. 
Most children his age would be utterly unaware of the significance behind this discussion, or its hidden meaning. Yet this boy seemed to have followed the exchange between the two noblemen perfectly. Wasn't this a bit too terrifying a display of intelligence and wisdom for a mere child to possess? Still, he did not know why, but the prince wanted to see what the boy would say and because of this, was quick to nod his head and accept Bruno's request. Go ahead boy, speak. Although Bruno had the memories of a middle-aged man, he had been reincarnated and born anew. Because of this, he was still a young child, and so he decided to play to these strengths. In doing so, he shot a kind smile at the young girl whose future was being discussed along with his. Before making a statement, that it would save his family from speaking out of turn against their betters. I would like to thank you for your benevolence your grace. It would be my honor to marry your daughter, whether she is officially recognized by your family as a member of your house or not. This remark stunned the prince. The truth of the matter was, he had not fully intended to marry his bastard daughter to Bruno. Rather, his reason for coming here today was to sabotage the von Zeipner family who he despised. After all, the von Zeipner family was venerated among many of the newer nobility who had earned their title over the course of the last century through gallantry in battle. Or through grand achievements in science and culture. If they lashed out against an older and more established noble family like that of the princes it could be used to slander all the new noble families. And that was the prince's real goal. But there were more people concerned about Bruno's statement than just the prince. For example, the boy's mother was quick to cry out in shock. Trying to tell her boy to shut his mouth in the most motherly way she could. Hush child. You don't know but her husband who raised his hand to silence her quickly stopped her. The man had few interactions with his youngest son over the years. But he had heard tales of the boy's genius. During their few encounters, the Lord knew that his son was harboring a frightening degree of intellect and wisdom, far more than a boy his age should possess. Not only that, but he had been keeping tabs on all his sons and their growth throughout the years. Among them all. Bruno alone stood out at such a young age. Because of this, the Lord gazed down at his son with a stern gaze and asked him a simple question. Depending how Bruno answered would determine his fate. Bruno, do you know what you are saying right now? What the Lord was really saying was, do you understand the consequences of your actions, and the effects it will have on your future? To which Bruno responded with an equally severe gaze as well as a slight nod of his head to his father, uttering a single word in response. And yet this word contained far more fortitude than it otherwise would have, especially when coming from a five-year-old boy. Perfectly. Bruno's father quickly sighed and shook his head, rubbing the bridge of his nose as if to soothe a headache. After which he turned to the prince who was still staring at the boy, as if something was wrong with him. The Lord's response ultimately shook the middle-aged prince from his stupor, making him fully realize that his plans had not gone as expected. You heard the boy. I have no choice but to accept your proposal. My son Bruno, and your daughter Heidi will be married when they both come of age. Or are you willing to retract your offer for reasons unknown to us all? It was evident by the expression on the prince's face, and that of his young mistress that they did not know immediately how to respond to this. They fully expected the Lord to refuse the offer and hopefully even make a scene, which they could use to tarnish the family's reputation, painting them and those like them as little more than ill-bred peasants masquerading as nobles. But this small boy had interfered, taking the weight off of his parents' shoulders, and carrying the burden on his own. It was truly bewildering. Before they could fully decide how to proceed, Bruno took the advantage, approaching the young girl who was still hiding behind her mother. Bruno wore the most kind and childish far a tilde section aid he could possibly manage, as he grabbed hold of the girl's hands and smiled at her. All the while confirming the deal was done. So your name is Heidi? It is a pleasure to meet you my lady, my name is Bruno. We are to be married when we are older, so I hope you will take good care of me when that day comes. The girl was not nearly as articulate as Bruno was as she was, after all, a normal child. But she broke out into tears when she saw how kind Bruno was treating her. 
and instinctively hugged him, an act which shocked him. Bruno's first instinct was to pull away, but his mother looked at him with an affectionate gaze upon seeing his kindness, ultimately compelling him to stay put while his young fiancé struggled to mutter the proper etiquette between her sobbing into his shoulder. I, I will, I will be in your care. At first, Bruno did not understand why the girl was sobbing. But it took him all of a few seconds to process that this was perhaps the first time anyone had ever shown her any kindness in her life, and because of this he fully accepted the girl's gesture, albeit while at a total loss for words. Though the prince, on the other hand, was beginning to panic. He had long since lost control of the plot, and his anxiety continued to get worse until, of course, Bruno shifted his gaze towards him. The boy mustered the most shit-eating grin he could manage, showing the prince that this battle had ended in Bruno's victory, causing the middle-aged man to damn near suffer a heart attack as he collapsed back onto the nearby desk, all the while struggling to breathe. His mistress quickly began to panic, not showing the least bit of concern towards her daughter's emotional outburst, and instead checking to see if the man was all right. Your Grace. Are you all right? though he appeared to be on the brink of death. All it took was for the man to rationalize that he had been bested by a mere child in order for him to eventually recover from his panic attack. He would ultimately recover his composure, after his embarrassing display, and storm out from the room entirely, leaving his mistress and their young daughter to follow shortly. Thereafter, you, I, we're leaving. Heidi's mother pulled her away from Bruno promising the girl that they would visit again before long. Whereas the girl would wipe the tears from her eyes and blush as she was dragged away by her mother, using all of her courage to wave goodbye with a forced smile to the boy who would one day be her husband when they both grew up. As for Bruno, he waved back to the girl with a perfect smile. And once she and her family were out of range, his expression sank back to a cold and stoic visage where he sighed heavily before turning to his father who gazed upon him with what appeared to be displeasure. Bruno's father, having grown up among soldiers had a bad habit of breaking etiquette when he was angry with his family, and was quick to call his son out for being a scheming prick in the most vulgar of terms that would normally be ill-befitting of a noble lord. You little shit! Just what are you planning? Bruno simply looked back at his father, remaining completely emotionless as he made a single statement before walking off. Nothing that you need to concern yourself with, father. After saying that, Bruno turned around and walked out the door. While his father collapsed in his seat and vented his frustrations to his wife. That little brat is going to be the death of me one day. As for Bruno's mother, she was filled with nothing but motherly affection towards her little genius who had rapidly become her favorite child, and rubbed her husband's shoulders while assuring the man that everything would be alright. On the contrary, our little boy just saved us a great deal of trouble. Ultimately, the Lord could not disagree with his wife's words. Had Bruno not been so quick thinking, and had not been willing to take a bullet for the family, then they could have ended up in real trouble. If Bruno was so capable at such a young age, then perhaps his father would have to pay more attention to him from here on out. Another two years had passed since that fateful day when Bruno found himself suddenly engaged to the bastard daughter of a princely family. And during this time, she became the only real friend the boy had. Heidi would visit Bruno's family home as frequently as her father would allow, where the two of them would mostly spend time together in the family library. The collection of knowledge within it was quite vast. Even if many of the subjects were woefully outdated by the standards of the 21st century, Bruno would treat the girl nicely, but he had an awkward time when dealing with her. In his past life, he was a middle-aged man with no family to speak of. He never really had any interaction with children outside of his own childhood. Because of this, he had a difficult time understanding how to socialize kids his own age after he had been reborn. But Heidi made this easy on Bruno, as she just seemed to be happy to have someone to speak to about her daily life and the problems in it. When Bruno was not having play dates with his young fiancé Tilda Copyright E, which was supervised by both of their mothers, he was in class, having begun his primary education earlier than most. 
but he did not go to a public institution, or a private one for that matter. Rather, his father had spared no expense to ensure private tutors who were masters of every field of education come to his home and teach the boy personally. Outside of these two activities Bruno either spent his time in self-learning, or playing chess. It was during this time that Bruno discovered something shocking about himself. It could not necessarily be confirmed, but it was definitely something he believed to be true. And that was the fact that his enhanced intelligence was not simply the result of him having memories from a past life in a world far more advanced than the one he currently lived in. Rather, his new body, more specifically its brain appeared to be at a genius level intellect. In his past life, Bruno, or Carl as he was known then was above average in intelligence, but nothing really special. It allowed him to perform well in the military as an infantry officer and later as an instructor at the Bundes Command and Staff College. But he was by no means a little genius. And this difference was demonstrated by how quickly he picked up the game of chess in this new lease on life. During this time, Heidi naturally took an interest in chess, as Bruno was commonly playing against himself during their time together. She begged him for weeks on end to teach her how to play the game until he finally relented. It took her months to finally get skilled at the game and confident enough to challenge Bruno to an actual match, where he ruthlessly and relentlessly obliterated her time and again, naturally causing the girl to become upset with him for not going easy on her. His response was callous and could be surmised as an old game a quote from his past life gicked which caused the young girl to remain angry at him and pout for the next two weeks of their gatherings. Eventually, however, she got over this. And life continued as normal. Bruno had mastered the game in roughly a year's time frame, competing against men much older, and with much more experience in the game where he would thoroughly dominate them. This could not be said to be the same in the life he had lived before this one. Rather, although he understood the basics of chess at that time, his skills were poor, even after being raised to play the game. He never came close to the title of master, and by the time he abandoned the game entirely, he knew it would never be a reality. Yet after a mere year of dedicating an hour or two to chess a day, Bruno knew he was well beyond the level that would be considered a chess master in his previous life. Perhaps the youngest in history. He could easily see five to ten moves ahead of his opponent and if he really concentrated, it might be even more than that. He had so thoroughly stunned his chess instructor that the man had given up trying to best him, stating that the boy was on a level well beyond his own. And it was when Bruno began to understand that his brain in this life had a significantly higher processing power that he began to address subjects of higher learning in his spare time. By the time his seventh birthday came around, Bruno's father had determined that he was old enough to begin learning how to train with firearms. And his father possessed quite a healthy collection of firearms. After all, he was the owner of a weapons manufacturing plant that manufactured everything from revolvers to howitzers. Not only that, but it was not until after the Great War had ended that most nations began enacting some form of gun control upon its ordinary citizens and the German Empire was no exception to this lack of restrictions during this time. Currently, the year was 1886, being seven years after Bruno's birth. This meant that the standard issue weaponry to the Imperial German Army was the Morse Model 1871-84 bolt-action rifle, and the Reichsevolver 1879, both of which his father possessed in his personal arsenal. In his past life, Bruno had little means to train with such obsolete weaponry. In the 21st century German nation, you would most commonly find such items as museum pieces. But he was aware of their existence and knew how they functioned. The Moors 1871-84 was a stopgap measure that was designed by the German Empire to compete with modern advancements in military weapons. Being one of the first, if not the first, nations to adopt a metallic cartridge firing bolt action rifle. The German Empire developed a variant of the Mauser 1871, in 1884 that was fitted with a tubular magazine allowing it to chamber more than one round, unlike the original. They also included a built-in extractor to eject the shell casings after they were used. 
In addition to this, the Moors 187184 was issued with a new, and more modern style bayonet. This was a more cost-effective means of modernizing the Imperial German Army's standard infantry rifle in order to compete with more powerful repeating firearms that recently came into play on the global stage. Something that other nations couldn't really do, because the previously issued single-shot rifles they used were of designs other than bolt action. It was a simple, affordable, and practical solution to a serious issue. But such methods of modernization usually had many drawbacks. In the case of the Moser 187184, it was heavy, really heavy. The original model of 1871 already weighed a whopping 4.5 kilograms, or 9.92 pounds, but with a 10-round tubular magazine which contained the mammoth 11.16 x 60 MMR cartridge, this weight only increased. For some reason, in the late mid late 1800s, militaries across the globe had the idea that the most suitable cartridge for waging war against your fellow man was one that was capable of taking down a charging buffalo with a single shot. It was overkill, and this was clearly realized in the final days of the 19th century when more modern and smokeless military cartridges were developed. But it would still be another two years before the Jew E-1888 commission rifle was released. And that meant that for the time being, Bruno was being taught how to fire a rifle whose recoil was quite literally capable of knocking a small child like himself on his ass. Not to mention its weight was difficult for a seven-year-old to shoulder. Still, his father was determined for the boy to learn how to properly shoot at a young age. And because of this, they went out to the firing range that was built on their personal property. The von Zapner estate was quite massive and was located in a rural area outside of Berlin. The wealth their family had gained by becoming merchants of war was no doubt extensive, and their primary residence naturally reflected this. It was large enough to safely contain a firing range. And when his further handed Bruno the unloaded rifle, he was quick to comment on the basic rules of gun safety, before eventually teaching him the loading procedure. It admittedly took Bruno some time to get comfortable loading the rounds into the built-in tubular magazine. Such methods of storing ammunition within a firearm were only really commonly found in shotguns within the 21st century, and even then, that was a completely different design. But after loading 10 rounds, and racking the bolt, so he could load another into the tubular magazine, a technique his father had not taught him, but was surprised to see that the boy figured out on his own. Bruno aimed the sights safely downrange, and towards the barrels of hay that rested on the berm roughly 100 meters out. Because it was difficult for him to stand and shoulder such a weapon, Bruno sat at a table and rested the rifle on a sandbag. It was a common tactic used for precision shooting. But in Bruno's case it was really his only way to learn how to fire such a heavy rifle at such a young age. The hay barrels he aimed at had targets painted on their ends, and Bruno could easily line up his sights. Which he did so as his father talked him through the process. All right son, so you're going to want to take your rear aperture, and line it up with your front sight po bang the gunshot rang throughout the ear, providing a deafening sound to those who were within the immediate vicinity of the rifle. And just as quickly as the shot was fired, so too was the bull's eye struck on the hay barrel down range. Bruno exhaled deeply after firing the shot. Astounding his further once more that he knew to hold his breath while taking aim. With a simple motion, he lifted the bolt up and pulled it back while ejecting the spent cartridge before sending it back to home with a solid push where he repeated the process, once more cutting off his father as he gave voice to his astonishment. How in the hell did you bang once more the man's words were drowned out by the gunshot, which accompanied the .43 caliber projectile as it tore through the air, and struck the target no more than one millimeter away from where the previous one had landed. Despite performing a marksman tear grouping during his first shot, Bruno exhaled deeply and shook his head. He was displeased with the fact that he had to use iron sights, rather than an optic. But it was still well over 100 years before such a thing became standard issue to infantry rifles. As for Bruno's father, he stared in disbelief at his son's performance. 
It took him several seconds to come back to his senses, where after seeing Bruno turn on the safety of the rifle and place the weapon back on the table, the Lord smacked his son across the back of his head and demanded an answer for how he knew such things despite this supposedly being his first time shooting. You little shit. Where the hell did you learn to shoot like that? Did your mother let you fuck with my guns while I was away on business? Seeing this as an excellent opportunity to screw with his siblings who commonly bullied him, Bruno put on a masterful display of innocence as he proclaimed his older brothers to be the culprits. I'm sorry, father, I was unaware that I could not shoot without your permission. Ludwig and Kurt said it was okay, and took me out to the range multiple times this last year. Was I not allowed to do so? Ludwig and Kurt were the two youngest of Bruno's older brothers, and were the most immature as a result. While his oldest siblings has more important things to worry about and thus couldn't be bothered to harass their youngest brother. These two particular brothers purposely found trouble with Bruno whenever they possibly could, and could be quite nasty when doing so. Apparently, Bruno's far eight older section aide was perfect because his father was immediately outraged by this prospect. Going on a rampage like Bruno had never seen before. Those little bastards. They have no idea how much fucking trouble they are in. When I get my hands on them, they will wish they were never born. Having thoroughly enraged his further and shifted the blame onto his siblings, Bruno would walk away from the incident without any form of punishment whatsoever. As for Ludwig and Kurt, they soon found themselves shipped off to boarding school. Meaning that Bruno had once more proven himself to be a scheming and devious little brat. One that solved the problem of his rampant bullying and harassment rather permanently. If there was one thing that Bruno learned on this day, it was that you should never touch a man's firearms without his expressed permission or presence. Another three years or so passed since the day Bruno had cunningly sent the two largest nuisances in his life off to boarding school. He seldom saw Kurt or Ludwig after that. Only during the holidays, and there appeared to be a deep sense of fear in their eyes whenever their gazes met his. It indeed took them a while to piece together that Bruno had effectively, and purposely sent them away to boarding school, more specifically the Royal Prussian Cadet Corps. It was the foremost military school for Prussian youth. And graduating from it successfully garnered one in their family great esteem. To graduate from the Cadet Corps was not a requirement to enter the Royal Prussian Main Cadet Institute, which was the primary institute for educating future officers of the Prussian and later Imperial German armies. But those who graduated from the Cadet Corps generally were given more favorability when it came to admissions. This may have eventually worked in the favor of Bruno's older brothers later in life, who were by no means capable of entering the Main Cadet Institute otherwise but they would no doubt have a grueling childhood as a result. As for Bruno himself, he knew that he did not need to attend a military school in order to gain admission to the main cadet institute, or the Prussian War College, for that matter. After all, in his previous life he had been a high-ranking military officer, one who after retirement was capable of being an instructor at the modern equivalent of the Prussian War College where generals were made. Because of this, he was able to live at home in a peaceful environment, one which helped foster his growth. Over the years, Heidi would continue to visit his home, under the supervision of both of their mothers, and the two of them would grow much closer. But despite all of this, Bruno had yet to be formally invited to the prince's estate, which was where his young fiancé Tilda copyright E resided. That is, until shortly after his tenth birthday. Bruno received a letter which conveyed such intent. This was strange to the boy. Why wait all these years to do this? What was the prince planning? It had been five years since he last saw the man, and foiled his plans to make his family look like a bunch of ill-mannered peasants. And during this time Bruno had not heard his father complain about the prince once. It was almost as if things were progressing swimmingly between their two families. Yet the fact remained. Bruno had not been invited out to the prince's estate to personally meet his family until today. As much as Bruno wanted to believe that there was some great conspiracy going on in the background, and to avoid it if at all possible he really had no choice but to answer the summons. And because of this, 
he arrived at the prince's estate at the requested date. The moment he arrived at the gates of the prince's palace, Bruno began to understand the difference between a family like his, and a family like the one which Heidi belonged to. Everything that could possibly be gilded with gold was done so. Even as the iron gates outside the estate's walls were covered in such a luxurious material, the main building itself, which housed the prince and his family, was significantly larger than Bruno's home. And his home was by no means small, especially when compared with the standards of the 21st century. It was, after all capable of housing a family of eleven in extremely luxurious conditions. But like all things in life, there were levels to fortune. And it was very apparent as Bruno's carriage passed through the gates and entered the driveway just outside the main entrance that he was dealing with a different breed of wealth. As Bruno stepped foot out of the carriage, he noticed that Heidi and her mother, along with a single servant who were there to greet him. Nobody else from the main family had bothered to show him any face, which, as a guest from another noble family that was invited to their home, was quite the insult. Still, Bruno did not make a remark on this, and simply smiled as he approached his young fiancée Tilda copyrightee, and gave her a friendly hug, remarking on how much she had grown since he last saw her which was just a month or two ago. You always astonish me with how much you grow in between our visits. At this rate, you will soon be taller than I am. Heidi giggled at Bruno's compliment, it was obviously laced with humor. The two of them were two years apart, and Bruno was quite tall for his age. Still, she was quick to greet the man she would one day marry with proper noble etiquette, even if she herself was a bastard taking a step back from the boy and performing a proper curtsy. As for the girl's mother, the relationship she had with Bruno as his future mother-in-law was quite complicated. She lived to please the prince, so long as she could do so, she could remain living on his estate in a life of luxury. Sure she may not live in the main house with the proper family, but she had her own manor on the grounds which was quite luxurious, equal to if not superior to the von Zeipner manor. However, Despite Heidi being the prince's daughter, the man did not really care for the girl, and made no moves to make her life better. Or worse, for that matter. He was simply indifferent to her. And on top of all of this, the prince still held a grudge against Bruno for spoiling his plans all those years ago. Meaning that even if Heidi's mother thought Bruno was a rather excellent match for her daughter, one that would no doubt raise her own prestige, what with being the mother-in-law of a true-born lord, she still couldn't outright show her approval. Because of this, her expression was rather cold towards Bruno as he greeted her as well. Miss Granger, it is a pleasure as always. When Bruno said this, he did not bow towards the woman, as he would do to the noble woman of higher prestige. Instead, he simply smiled and complimented. Rather as a low-born woman herself, it was Heidi's mother who was forced to bow to him, and refer to him with the proper honorifics. My lord. Although it pains the master, he has informed me that he will not be joining us for dinner tonight. Rather, I have invited you out here, with the lord's permission, so that you can spend some proper time with your fiancé Tilda copyright tea. It has, after all been nearly two months since you last seen each other. If you would please follow me, Heidi and I will escort you to the manor in which we reside. Bruno nodded his head and followed Heidi and her mother to their own small portion of the massive estate. All while looking back upon the primary residence, which was essentially a palace in size and scale. He could only surmise that this entire invitation was the prince's way to put Bruno in his place. Eventually, the group all arrived at the manor on the estate grounds. It was indeed similar in size and scale to Bruno's own family home, but not nearly as luxurious, if he was being honest. Still, it was a much better residence than a common girl of poor background like Miss Granger could ever hope to marry into, or possess herself. And because of this, Bruno naturally understood why she decided to be the prince's mistress. However, once inside the building, Heidi's mother was quick to come up with an excuse to run off. Well. So long as the two of you are attended by the young lord's guards, and Gertrude here, I suppose it would be fine for me to go off and check to see if the kitchen staff is running on time. Heidi, 
to be a good girl, and show your future husband around our home, will you? Heidi nodded towards her mother. There wasn't the usual excitable, or joyful expression that Bruno had come to expect from the girl whenever they interacted. Rather, she appeared slightly timid, as if disobeying her mother would have grand consequences. Nor was her voice anything but monotone. I will do as you say, mother. This surprised Bruno, but after the girl's mother had wandered off, she returned to her usual happy self as she questioned where Bruno wanted to play around at first. I'm so happy you have finally come to visit, my lord. You don't know how happy this makes me. So, where would you like to go first? Despite being engaged to Bruno, Heidi was still the bastard daughter of a prince and a commoner. Which means that until the day they were officially married, she would continue to refer to Bruno, who was of higher social standing with the proper terms. Especially when they were not alone. Bruno had wanted a proper tour, and immediately asked for it. Hoping to see the differences between the home of a prince's mistress, and that of a nouveau riche and a recent noble family like his own. As Bruno was guided through the girl's home, he noticed that Heidi's maid was keeping a close eye on him. Why exactly he did not understand. Perhaps she wanted to make sure he did not try anything inappropriate with the girl? But he was not yet at that age would hormones would override his reason, nor did he have any such intentions towards the young girl. As far as he was concerned, he was simply protecting his family's interests by continuing to see her. And though he would never admit it, he had grown to see his future wife as a close personal friend, and felt a duty to protect her, even if he had no romantic feelings towards the girl. Whatsoever. Ultimately, Bruno chose to ignore these glances. That is until he and the girl went out into the yard, where they found that a group of teenage girls were lying in wait for them in the gardens. These young maidens varied in age by a few years, but there was no mistaking it. They were true noble girls. Must likely the legitimate daughters of the prince. Why they were waiting in the small, albeit beautiful gardens which were outside their father's mistress's home. Well. Bruno had a thought regarding this in mind already. And his suspicions were concerned when Heidi suddenly stopped in her tracks upon seeing her half-sisters. Timidly hiding behind Bruno and shaking as she held his hand tightly for comfort. Bruno naturally did not shy away from the girl. She was genuinely terrified her sisters who quickly approached them with smug grins on their faces. The oldest of which appeared the age of adulthood not far away at all from being married off to some noble scion. Due to her age, she was naturally taller than Bruno was, standing in front of him and looking down on him with a smirk that oozed with self-satisfaction. When she spoke to Bruno, it was with a mixture of contempt, but slight surprise. So you're the Junker's son who has been engaged to this little piece of trash? I have heard rumors about you. They say you're an unparalleled genius and an expert marksman despite your age. I have to say, I'm a bit surprised, you're a bit cuter than I thought you would be. You should consider it your greatest honor that this young lady has decided that you will escort her for the evening. Come with me and leave this common tramp where she belongs. The girl's younger sisters looked at her with confusion. Weren't they going to use their privilege and status to make their little half-sister eat bugs in front of her fiancé tilde copyright he? Why all of a sudden was she changing the plot? But before they could ask the question, the young woman reached out to grab a Bruno's wrist in an attempt to force the boy away from his fiancé tilde copyright e by force. Heidi was just about to break out into tears when she realized that her oldest sister, the one who most frequently came to make trouble for her, was going to take her friend, not her fiancé tilde copyright away from her. However, before the tears could fully develop, the most shocking thing happened. Bruno forcefully pulled his wrist away from the young princess before slapping her across her face. All while speaking to her in a stern tone. Like that of an outraged parent lecturing an errant child. The only trash I see here is you lot. What sick machinations did you have in mind when you decided to lie in wait for us here? Tell me, what cruel plot did you three bitches come up with to torture this little girl who, as far as I am aware has never wronged any of you? All three of the prince's true-born daughters were stunned into silence by Bruno's actions. All the while, 
The oldest of the trio broke out into tears over the stinging red handprint on her cheek. She had never in her life been disciplined before. Not by her father, and most certainly not by her fiancé. Why would she? She was practically a princess, and quite the beautiful one at that. To think that this mere child, this mere Junker's son, would actually slap her. It enraged her. Her expression became hideous as she recovered her senses, and when she did so, she pointed and screamed at Bruno, threatening him with her father's eventual retaliation. W.H. Who do you think you are you little shit? You little Junker's son. You dare lay a hand on me? My father will hear of this, and when he does you will lose that hand you dared to strike me with. After saying this, she stormed off, where her sisters scurried after her, leaving Bruno to sigh in relief. He turned around, hoping to find that Heidi had calmed down after he stood up for her. But instead, she immediately broke out into tears and clung to him, all the while expressing how sorry she was for getting him in trouble on her behalf. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry Bruno. It's all because of me. If I was never born, you wouldn't have to suffer on my behalf. The girl was terrified that Bruno would literally lose a hand for slapping the face of the prince's eldest daughter. As for Bruno, his expression was both serious, yet warm. As he grabbed hold of the little girl's cheeks and assured her that everything would be alright. Don't you ever talk like that again, Heidi. You should never blame yourself for the cruelty which this world inflicts upon you. It was not you who decided to be born a bastard. That was God's decision. And he alone bears the responsibility for what has been done to you. But so long as I am by your side, it is my duty, as your fiancé tilde copyrighty, and in the future, your husband to protect you from that cruelty. Even if I must make an enemy of your father, and suffer his wrath because I dared to perform the role that he should have been fulfilling all this time. Heidi continued to cry when she heard this. But it was not tears of guilt that ran down her adorable little face, rather it were tears of joy. That Bruno had chosen to protect her and stand by her side. Even when faced with the harassment of her sisters and the retaliation of his father. Which no doubt would soon arrive. It did not take long for the young princess to return to her father and report what Bruno had done to her. Granted, as a young woman aggrieved, she purposely left out certain details that painted her in a bad light, and may have justified Bruno's behavior. Because of this, the prince quickly arrived at the manor which Heidi and her mother resided in, with several armed guards by his side. These were not soldiers of the army, nor did they wear military uniforms. But they were veterans who were paid a hefty sum to protect the prince and his family. Upon arriving in the gardens where Bruno was in the act of comforting Heidi, the prince quickly pointed at the boy and demanded his guards around him. That's him. That's the little shit who struck my daughter, seize him. Bruno quickly acted on instinct, placing Heidi safely behind him, as the multiple armed guards came to apprehend Bruno for assaulting the prince's daughter. There was just one problem. When the man closest to Bruno reached out to grab him, Bruno quickly grabbed hold of the man's wrist and swept him to the floor with a hip throw. He had in his past life learned the basics of grappling and unarmed combat in the army. It wasn't exactly something he specialized in, but he knew how to throw a grown man to the ground. And despite being only ten years old, with the right technique and leverage it could be accomplished. The guard hit the ground while his comrades quickly lowered their rifles at Bruno, and Heidi, meanwhile Bruno held his captive in an arm lock, while shouting at the prince to calm himself. Your grace? Is this how you treat your guests? Attempting to arrest them in your own home with armed mercenaries? Under what grounds do you dare? The prince had always been cautious about Bruno, especially after being bested by the boy when he was a mere five years old. To him this was a simple mishap on his part, and he justified his loss by saying he could not have anticipated that the boy would develop a crush on his bastard daughter and immediately agree to his offer of betrothal. Nor that the lord who was Bruno's father would accept such a childish mistake. Nevertheless, the prince had kept a close eye on Bruno and his development over the years. And he knew that the boy was indeed more intelligent and wise than he should be at his age. Still. 
He did not believe he would fall prey to the boy's cunning twice, and was quick to announce the charges laid against Bruno to his face. What grounds do you say? I'm arresting you under charges of assaulting a noble lady. Do you have the gall to deny these claims? There was a smug look on both the prince's face, and that of his daughter who brought this matter to his attention. Meanwhile, Heidi had fallen to her knees, and was trembling at the intense conflict that was taking place at this minute. She was shocked to see Bruno release his prisoner and pat the man on the back, before addressing her father's statement in a way which she had not anticipated. Assault? That would depend on how you define the term? Did I slap that young maiden by your side who I presume to be your daughter? Most certainly. But were my actions justified? Absolutely so. Did your daughter tell you why I left that mark upon her face? It was because she dared to lay her hands on me, a noble lord, without my permission. She attempted to force me away from my fiancé tilde copyright e without my consent. I do after all have the right to defend my person, do I not your grace? If an older woman is attempting to take me away from where I am supposed to be, and from the supervision I am protected by. What ill intentions could she possibly have towards me? When the prince heard this, he eyed his daughter with a fearsome gaze. She had not mentioned that she tried to force Bruno away from his fiancée, and physically so at that. She may be a little princess, but she was still a woman. One who had a fiancé. Regardless of her intentions, she had acted in a way that, if spun successfully by her father's enemies, could reflect very poorly on their family. And because of this, he was quick to confirm whether or not this was true. He knew his daughter would never lie to him, especially when some pressure was applied. Perhaps because of this, his voice was filled with suppressed rage. Is this true? Did you lay your hands on this boy? The young princess, perhaps because she had been spoiled her entire life, did not see why this was such a big deal. So she wanted to go play with this little boy and perhaps leave a mark on his neck that would traumatize his little fiancé tilde copyright he. What was the big deal? It's not like she planned to go all the way with him. Because of this twisted and narcissistic mindset, she was quick to confess to her crimes, so to speak. Yeah? And? I just grabbed his wrist. It's not like I smack even Bruno's mouth fell agape when he saw the prince backhand his daughter across the face. He knew the girl well enough to guess what her intentions were and was quick to chastise her for it. You fool! Do you have any idea what the repercussions of your actions are? This boy's father is a prominent member of the Junker faction. They may be nothing more than up-jumped peasants, but if words get out that you tried to do something inappropriate with him, there will be hell to play. I'm sick of you causing problems simply because you are upset with my affairs. Go to your room and reflect on your actions. You will not be eating tonight. Bruno was honestly astonished that this alone had quelled the dispute between him and the prince. I mean, he had prepared several other threats to get out of this situation in one piece. For example, the disrespect he was shown on this day, by receiving a formal invitation by the prince, only to be pawned off to his mistress's manner, was enough to outrage the entire Junker community. The Junkers were a prominent faction in Prussian politics, but now that the German nation had become unified by Prussia, they were prominent across all the empire. Junker was a term to describe those noble families like his own that were young and minor. But they were a landed nobility intended to have a large degree of authority over all Germany's arable land. Combine that with their recent foray into the military leadership, and the formation of a political coalition around them and they had become a prominent faction in the German Reich. The Junkers were in stark contrast to the ancient nobility that had gained their titles in the medieval era, and had amassed their wealth over centuries. Naturally, the two factions were at odds with one another. Seeing as how the von Zeipner family were wealthy industrialists who manufactured many of the Imperial Army's weapons, it was safe to say that by showing Bruno such disrespect the prince was showing disrespect to all Junkers, including the current Chancellor Otto von Bismarck who came from such a background. Bruno had this guard in his reserves, 
in case his threats of spinning the young princess' actions into being something woefully inappropriate was not enough to convince the prince to stand down. But ultimately, his first attempt had done the trick, with the prince quickly settling the matter with an apology and the dismissal of his bodyguards. My apologies Lord Bruno. My daughter's actions were indeed worthy of a slap to the face. It appears to me that my staff may have misunderstood my orders, and sent you here to my mistress's home instead of coming to visit me personally first. This has all been a giant misunderstanding. If you would come with me, I would like to personally welcome you to my estate. Bruno eyed the man carefully. It was abundantly clear to him that after threatening to expose his daughter's intentions, even if they were exaggerated, the man had caught on that Bruno had seen through his schemes, and was trying his best to rectify them in order to not give the boy more to condemn him with. It was a smart move to pin the blame on servants, and because of this Bruno had been forced into a corner as well. He had no choice but to go to the main estate and visit the prince and his proper family, who no doubt would be far more hostile to him, especially after this drama that had just unfolded. However, Bruno was insistent that he was not going alone, and was quick to demand Heidi come with him. This was his way of escaping any potentially dangerous situation that may follow. As he knew the prince would not allow this and would be forced to settle. Are you forgetting someone, your grace? I have come all this way to see my fiancé Tilda copyrighty at her home. While I do appreciate the invitation to get properly acquainted with your family, it was my understanding that this visit was meant to further foster the bonds between myself and my future bride. Or was I mistaken? I mean, if I were to have been so mistaken, then I wonder why your servants thought it would be appropriate to send me over your mistress's residence without even allowing me to properly pay my respects to the head of the house. In his haste to cover his tracks, the prince had played right into Bruno's hands. Bruno had quickly sprung a trap on him. And that was to make it, so that Heidi, his bastard daughter, who had never been permitted to step foot into the primary residence within the estate, could do so at long last. This was a serious problem, due to the fact that the prince's wife was quite the envious woman. And though she begrudgingly allowed her husband's mistress and illegitimate daughter to live on the grounds of the estate, it was under the condition that they would never be allowed into her home. Bruno, of course waited very patiently for the response of the prince who was trying to think all of this through, and how to get out of the predicament he was currently in. Ultimately, the prince made the smart move of deciding to call an end to this visit prematurely. Oh dear, this entire day has just been one giant disaster hasn't it? I do apologize for the inconvenience I have caused. I fear at this point it would be best to simply call an end to this catastrophe once and for all. Lord Bruno, I will make sure that those responsible for today's events are thoroughly rebuked for their failures and promise that during your next visit you will be appropriately compensated. How does that sound? The truth of the matter was, Bruno did not want to leave the prince without having a way out of this mess. As far as he was concerned, this was a petty matter between the two of them that was better off being swept under the rug. However, he wanted certain assurances that Heidi would not receive any form of retaliation from either the prince, his family, or anyone in his employ because of this and he was quick to comment on this matter before accepting the offer of simply parting ways. That sounds fair to me, your grace. I am, after all, quite exhausted from this whole ordeal. However, before I go, I want your personal vow that neither Heidi, her mother, or anyone in their employ receive any form of grief because of this whole incident. And while I would not presume you would stoop so low as to dishonor yourself, I do fear that your daughters have ill intentions towards my fiancé Tilda copyright E. Especially after this ugly business just now. I also fear that they might cowardly scheme against the girl, her mother, or her servants by using members of your house against them. So long as you ensure their safety from any form of reprisal, I promise you I will let this matter go and speak of it to no one, not even my father. As much as the prince was absolutely seething right now, he could not make it apparent on his face. 
Bruno had thought of every little thing to press him into a corner where he had to drop the matter entirely. He could not punish Heidi for today's events, nor could he inflict any suffering on her mother. Or vent his frustration on the girl's servants. He was well and truly forced to let go of today's incident. And by a ten-year-old brat, no less. Because of this, the man was forced to utterly quell his rage. And agree to the terms Bruno had presented accepted his defeat with a silent submission, while verbally expressing it as a draw. Of course, I would never wish for innocence to be caught up in this messy business. Had I known my daughters were mistreating your fee on Katilda copyright he sooner, I would have stepped in. This has truly been an enlightening experience, on which we have both benefited from. And though the prince said these polite words, he was thoroughly pissed off from everything that happened this day. He would take his leave immediately thereafter, using the maid who attended to Heidi to properly send Bruno off. Meanwhile, the prince would return to his office, and vent his rage the only way he could as per his agreement, and that was by throwing a hissy fit in his office. Tossing tables over, and breaking everything that wasn't worth anything of value from his perspective. As for Bruno, he would say his farewells to Heidi, and assured her that things would be different from now on. Though the girl was reluctant to part with him after everything that had happened, he compelled her to see reason with his goodbye. Though I wish I could say that it had been a pleasure, I would be lying if I did so. Still, with all things considered I did enjoy the time I spent with you today. I'm just upset that we could not enjoy dinner together. There is no need to be afraid. After a slap like that, I doubt your sisters will dare find trouble with you again and your father has promised to restrain himself and his staff around you. Things should be much better for you from now on." Heidi silently nodded her head and blushed, averting her gaze from Bruno. Despite the roller coasters of emotions she felt today, she was very happy that Bruno had come to visit, even after everything that had happened. Because of this, she made an act that thoroughly surprised Bruno as he stood in her doorway, being led out by her maid. The girl leaned in close and pecked Bruno on the cheek, causing the boy, with the mind of a middle-aged man to lose his composure, and track of thought. After which she thanked him with a sheepish tone before running off, too embarrassed to stay any longer. Thank you. For everything. Bruno stood in the doorway, completely absent-minded, his conscious state only returning, and his heart only settling after the girl's maid giggled, no doubt laughing at him. It seems the young lord's heart can be moved after all. You're a very lucky boy. Even though you don't know it, Heidi works very hard for the future. Outside of her studies she spends most of her time learning how to cook, and clean, and maintain a proper home. This remark only further caused Bruno's mind to be thrown into disarray as he looked at the satisfied smile on the maid's face. She then leaned close and whispered something in his ears that he found to be completely alarming. Be careful, young lord. The prince has eyes and ears everywhere. He has been watching your progress for years, and after today's efforts he may even begin to move against you in the shadows. He's threatened by your intelligence. You must be very careful moving forward. After saying this in the most severe tone possible, the maid returned to her usual self smiling at Bruno as she spoke to him as if he were a child, escorting him to his carriage where his escort remained awaiting his arrival. Though they were shocked that the young master was heading out so soon, well before dinner, Bruno would not tell them why. Only that everything was fine, and he simply felt the sudden urge to return home. As promised to the prince, what happened on this day remained entirely among the parties involved. For after hearing what the maid had said, Bruno had suddenly become much more cautious. So much so that he felt the need to adjust certain things about his future plans and behaviors going forward. Following the warning that Bruno received from Heidi's maid, he immediately began to change how he depicted himself. He had not properly thought through the consequences of what displaying such a terrifying intellect and cunning nature at such a young age would have on him. Until now he had displayed the potential to become a world-class genius like that of da Vinci, Newton, or Tesla. A man capable of changing the very world around him. And while such expectations came with many perks, 
it created as many, if not more dangers. Because of this, Bruno spent the next five years dumbing down his public persona. As if he peaked in childhood, Bruno suddenly went from being known for having the potential to be a peerless genius among humanity to a peerless genius among kids his own age. Even his parents were not clued in on this, and assumed it was simply a matter of age and personal development. That he had reached a bottleneck as he grew older. And while his father came to expect less of him, his mother still considered Bruno to be her favorite son, her little genius. Bruno's initial plans to attend university at an unusual age were thwarted by his own genius. Instead, he was forced to endure following years of schooling with those his own age, attended a private academy for Germany's elite and noble youth in the day, while returning home to his peaceful family life in the afternoon. Five years passed like this, and the suspicions of Heidi's father, a man by the name of Prince Gustav von Bentham Tekelenburg had finally subsided. He too bought into the far a tilde section aid that Bruno created for himself. Gustav was a man of esteemed power and wealth. His family was of ancient and high nobility, and had once been rulers of their own vast lands. However, following the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire their lands were annexed and mediatized by the Kingdom of Prussia, where in 1817, they were elevated to the status of princes, and in 1854 were granted a hereditary seat in the Prussian House of Lords. There was a reason the man was so prideful about his family's position and was so antagonized by the junker upstarts such as Bruno's family. But with his eyes no longer lingering on Bruno the boy had been able to develop quite swimmingly. Over the course of the past five years, Bruno continued his independent studies, not only mastering the basic subjects that were acquired for graduation from the Royal Prussian Main Cadet Institute. But he also began to explore skills that would become necessary for his future ambitions of leading Germany to military and political dominance in the coming century. Subjects he had ignored in his previous life such as politics, economics, and mechanical engineering became the primary interests of his personal study. But in addition to this, Bruno began to master the art of fencing. The era of the sword had long since passed. Guns and bayonets had replaced the need for close quarters combat in most cases. And though the militaries of the day continued to delude themselves with chivalric notions of cavalry charges, the sad truth of the matter is such units became obsolete decades ago. But that was neither here nor there. There was a tradition of academic fencing among the German nobility, as well as its military. And though duels were outlawed years prior back in 1851 within Prussia, and later in 1871 when Germany was united under their banner. The fact remained that duels to first blood were still a common occurrence among the nobility, and the military to settle disputes, and would remain so until the outbreak of the Great War in 1914, which was still decades away. Because of this, Bruno spent a considerable amount of time over the past five years mastering a variety of sword styles in case the need should ever arrive to defend his honor, or that of his woman. Eventually, his fifteenth birthday came and passed, where Bruno was invited to a gathering of noble youth, for the celebration of Princess Victoria Louise of Prussia, who was the daughter of Kaiser Wilhelm II. Bruno and his family were only invited to such a prominent gathering due to his father's position in the Reichstag, which he had been elected to as a representative of the Junker coalition during the previous year. Though his father's aims were far more ambitious as he sought to be appointed to the Bundesrat which was the higher of Germany's bicameral legislature, and more specifically be placed on the Committee of Land Army and Fortresses which would naturally allow himself to place his own family's arms corporation and its products as a priority in terms of future military procurement. But to do that, Bruno's father would need to make connections to the Kaiser, who was also the King of Prussia. Meaning that this ball gathering for the princess upcoming second birthday was the perfect opportunity for such matters. Bruno was not the only one of his siblings afforded the honor of attending this event. In fact, it would be a gathering of thousands of noblemen and their families at the Kaiser's personal palace. And tonight was the night of the event. Bruno looked at himself in the mirror. He had grown so much since first reincarnating into this world. 
In his past life, he was a relatively mundane looking man. Especially as he grew older, one would not think much of his appearance. But in this life he had been reborn as a noble scion, and in all honesty his facial features were not half bad. In fact, he was rather handsome by the standards of the day. His golden blonde hair was neatly parted into a style that would be fashionable in the coming decades. While his relatively muscular and athletic physique was hidden behind the ultra-luxurious tailcoat which he wore, by no means had Bruno neglected his physical training in this life and instead was in far better shape than most men of the day. Physical fitness would be a supreme requirement for his future military career, and he was preparing for that day which appeared to be nearing ever closer. There was a knock on Bruno's door as he adjusted his boaty so that it was perfectly straight. Followed by a familiar voice. The voice was feminine, like that of a young girl who was quickly blossoming into a woman. It was meek, and quite embarrassed, as it called out to Bruno from behind. My lord. Are you ready? Bruno was honestly slightly surprised that his date for the evening had come to personally gather him for the event. But he quickly pushed this to the back of his mind and opened the door to reveal his darling little fee on K tilde copyright E. Despite having the memories of a middle-aged man from his past life, Bruno was currently a teenager physically. His body was flooding with hormones that controlled his thoughts. And because of this, when he gazed upon Heidi's teenage form, as she was dressed in a lavish Victorian style dress, while wearing the accompanying jewelry he couldn't help but get slightly flustered. He had no idea when they were kids that the girl he would one day married when they became adults would become such a beautiful woman, and she still had plenty of time to further develop. Bruno was forced to shake his head, and remind himself that he shouldn't be having any inappropriate thoughts. But it was hard to do so, with the young woman bashfully averting her gaze from the boy, while her face was as equally flustered as his, rather than wear her usual twin braid style. She had tidied her golden locks into an elegant bun. And if Bruno was being honest, it added an air of maturity that the girl did not normally have. The two of them persisted in a state of an awkward silence, until ultimately Heidi interrupted it, stammering while she did so. My. My lord. You really should not have spent so much on this dress and jewelry. It is unbefitting for a bastard like me to waste so much of your money. It was not as if Bruno knew why Heidi felt this way. Though he had stopped her bullying problems at home, the ridicule she would receive by the noble girls who were friends with her sisters was something he had no control over. And because of this, the girl was still deeply self-conscious about her position in life. Bruno alone had the ability to convince her to be more confident of herself, which he was quick to do so, with a charming smirk as he grabbed hold of her dainty chin and forced his fiancé tilde copyright e to look him in the eyes. My lord? I have told you this a thousand times, Heidi, but I don't like it when you refer to me by my title when we are alone together. Besides, I spend my money how I please, is it a sin for me to bestow my future bride with a wardrobe worthy of her beauty? Heidi's face was as red as can be. She seemed to have a hard time expressing herself and quickly ran off, no longer able to face Bruno after he said such embarrassing things to her. I'll wait for you in the automobile my. Bruno. Once she was gone, Bruno sighed and shook his head, thinking how much he would have fallen for the girl if he didn't have his old memories in his head. But give her five more years when she was finally an adult, and even he wouldn't be able to resist such feelings. After thinking this, Bruno left the corridor and entered the grand hall of his family's manor, where he saw his brother Ludwig and his parents waiting patiently for his arrival. Ludwig was the only other of their children who had not yet reached the age of majority and moved out after marrying their fiancé Tilda Copyright E. Kurt and all of Bruno's other siblings would meet them at the venue. When Bruno's mother saw her youngest boy enter the venue, she ran up and hugged him. She always displayed a little too much motherly affection towards him. His mother's name was Elsa, and frankly, she matched the image that immediately came to mind when he heard the name that should otherwise belong to a princess. Elsa couldn't help but make an embarrassing statement about her youngest child and his current refined appearance. My baby boy is all grown up. 
You will be the most handsome young gentleman at the ball. Ludwig couldn't help but immediately rolled his eyes at the scene presented to him. No matter how old Bruno became, their mother would still treat him as if he were a small child. Even Bruno was embarrassed by the overly affectionate behavior, and shoved his mother aside, while chastising her as if he were the parent. Enough, mother. I'm no longer a child. It's not acceptable for a woman your age to be so handsy with me. Elsa pouted like a girl half her age and pulled her son's ear while lecturing him about her audacity to scold her. Who do you think the parent is between the two of us, young man? Dear, are you just going to sit there and not properly discipline our son? Bruno's father, who shared the same name as his youngest son simply looked at his wife and sighed heavily in exhaustion. She had always been this way with their youngest child. Perhaps it was because the boy was her youngest that she continued to treat him like a baby. But ultimately, no matter how many times he scolded her about it, she would continue to do so. He was resigned to endure such embarrassment, and instead simply told the family to get into the automobile so they could head to the venue. All right that's enough, Bruno. Your young fiancé Tilda copyright he is already waiting for you in the automobile. As for you Ludwig. Your own betrothed is already at the venue, waiting for you to arrive. So let's not waste any further time. With this said, the family set off in their luxurious able to their destination. While the automobile was by no means common, and horse travel was still the primary means of travel within cities like Berlin, the wealthy did have access to early forms of such vehicles which were invented a mere eight years prior, and Bruno's family was no exception to this. After arriving at the Kaiser's palace, and being properly greeted into the main hall where a massive gathering of nobles was taking place, Bruno took Heidi's hand, who was shaking with anxiety, and led her into the venue. Many eyes were drawn to the two of them. Not only because of Bruno's family's recently established position within German politics, but because they were shocked that the rumors were actually true. Until now. Bruno and Heidi had never truly been to a public event such as this together. Bruno after all had a tendency to avoid such social gatherings, as he had no interest in rubbing shoulder with a bunch of rich snobs who acted like they were superior to them because their great-great-grandfather may have invented something like the toilet brush. No, he would rather mingle with people who had more promising talents, still at his father's behest he was forced to attend today. And since it was a social gathering, he naturally brought his young fiancé Tilda copyright E with him. Heidi was well known for being the illegitimate daughter of a wealthy prince, and there had been rumors that her engagement existed between her and the youngest son of a wealthy junker. But now it was fully confirmed, and people stared and made whispers among one another. But there was one thing that people did not expect, and that was the fact that the young bastard girl would, when dressed up, exhibit the qualities associated with her noble bloodline. Her elder sisters were at the event and stared with hideous expressions at their youngest half-sister, who, despite being just barely capable of embracing the moniker teenager was already more beautiful than any of them. When dressed in such luxurious attire, which Bruno had spared no expense on her behalf, she was the one who looked the most like a fairy tale princess among them. And this was naturally a factor which contributed to the amount of onlookers both she and Bruno received as they entered the venue. Knowing how frightened Heidi had become due to all the looks and whispers she was receiving, Bruno shocked her by pulling her into his arms. And stated the words that absolutely made every noble girl and woman in attendance furious beyond measure. Don't worry about the onlookers. They are simply jealous of your natural beauty. Now. How about the two of us go have some fun? Even though the attention she was receiving was truly a dreadful experience for the girl, so long as Bruno was by her side, she was quick to follow him with a smile on her face. As you wish, my lord. Bruno had little concern for making connections on this night like his father did. In fact, he had already stuck out more than he wanted to. He felt this was due to how bright Heidi shined next to him. Completely unaware that he himself had caught the interest of several young noble maidens was envious towards Heidi not only because of the regal beauty which she emanated but also because she was with Bruno. Instead, the two of them enjoyed themselves, 
as if this entire event had nothing to do with them, as if they were all alone, and not surrounded by a litany of pampered noblemen and women. The two of them had barely paid attention when the Kaiser himself, the ruler of the German Empire appeared at the venue, along with his two-year-old daughter who this extravagant event was being thrown for. Although he paid little attention to the man, Bruno did notice the Kaiser. In his past life he was well aware of this man, and the bad reputation he was unfairly given due to the defeat of Germany in the Great War as well as the abominable Treaty of Versailles that followed. Unfortunately for the Kaiser, he was blamed for many of the problems that plagued Germany following the end of the war, most of which were actually the faults of the Social Democrats and their precious Weimar Republic, a state which sought to submit to France, as well as the interests of international corporations, both of which had a desire to bleed Germany as much as possible for since they were not responsible for committing. It was revenge, plain and simple for the humiliating defeat which the French suffered at the hands of the Germans in 1871. And unfortunately the Kaiser was the one who took the blame for it all. But there were still well over twenty years before such problems manifested themselves. And because of this, Kaiser Wilhelm II was a beloved figure in the German Reich. Bruno took note of this historical figure, before returning his attention to Heidi who had no interest in things like politics, or noble hierarchy. The girl's anxiety had largely faded away throughout the night as she focused her attention on her future fiancé Tilda Copyright, whom she had known and gotten along with since they were young children. Though Bruno didn't realize it, she was quite literally counting down the days before she turned 18 and could marry him. Which was still another five years away. This was partially out of a desire to become free of her family, but far more so because she had long since fallen in love with the boy which, as she entered her teenage years, only further intensified with new and embarrassing desires. Bruno was only slightly aware of the girl's feelings towards him. He really didn't know exactly how strong they were. But he himself still treated the girl as a close friend, and someone he was bound to protect because in the future they would indeed be married. Romantically speaking, he had yet to consciously be aware of any feelings towards her even if they were bubbling in the background of his hormone-addled mind. Because of this, the two of them comfortably chatted in the background of the event, entirely unaware that there had been a very sinister set of eyes latching onto the couple. And those were the eyes of Princess Clara von Bentham Tecklenburg, who was the eldest sister of Heidi's. By now she was in her early twenties, and was fully married to a prince from a proper principality. After being slapped by Bruno years ago, Clara had never forgiven the man, nor her half-sister Heidi who from then on she was not allowed to directly bully or harass. Still, she had used her influence to get her peers to pressure Heidi whenever they could. Because of this, Heidi spent most of her days locked away inside her mother's manor, waiting for those days when Bruno could come to visit her or vice versa. As any attempt to make friends was thoroughly dashed by her sister's petty need for revenge. But on this day, Clara drank a bit too much wine after witnessing her half-sister outshine her. And when she was speaking to her husband, complaining about Heidi and Bruno, she let something slip that she shouldn't have. Especially after the woman's husband questioned why she was so angry. Clara, darling, why does it bother you so? The boy you speak of is the ninth son of Junker, and that girl is a bastard. They are beneath the concern of people such as ourselves. Clara's husband was not just a prince of a proper principality, but he was the third in line to the throne. Only if his two older brothers passed away, then he would become the reigning prince, after their father finally kicked the bucket that is. Germany had several small principalities, that were states that did not compare to the much larger and more significant states such as Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, etc but through the complicated process of the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, and the unification of the German Empire, somehow these minor regions kept the prestigious title of prince and princesses. This man was one of those princes, and he, like Clara's father had a disdain for the lower and newer nobility. Let alone bastards and commoners. But Clara was really upset about people that should otherwise be beneath her notice. And this confused the man. Intoxicated as she was, 
Clara grit her teeth and hissed the truth, which she was never supposed to reveal. I know that. But that little shit. He dared to lay his hands on me, and I can never forgive him for that. A sense of rage went down the prince's spine. That teenage boy laid a hand on his wife? When, and in what manner? Was it violent or sexual? Or God forbid sexually violent? The very idea enraged the man as he quickly set his wife aside and began to walk towards Bruno. Wait here one moment. I want to have a chat with this little boy. Instantly realizing that she had said something she shouldn't have, Clara tried to grab the prince's wrist and prevent him from making a scene, but she was apparently so drunk that her depth perception was off. As for her cries to halt his actions, they were drowned out by the sound of the festivities in the background. Wait. You can't. Bruno was on the dance floor with Heidi when a man in his early twenties came walking towards him with a stern expression on his face. Years of paranoia caused by constantly being on the lookout for Prince Gustav's spies had taught Bruno to keep his head on a swivel at all times, and he quickly ceased his dance with Heidi, who was too caught up in a moment to understand what was going on. For safety reasons, Bruno placed the girl behind him as he stood brazenly in front of the man who approached him. Much to his shock, and everyone else in the ballroom. Prince Julius von Lipp pulled off his white glove and slapped Bruno across the face with it, immediately shouting some nonsense at him, while challenging the 15-year-old boy to a duel. You little brat, you dare to lay hands on my wife. I demand satisfaction. Apologize to my wife this instant, or find me at dawn and we will settle this like proper men. The echo of the prince's slap was like that of a gunshot going off. It immediately drew everyone's attention to what was going on. The 21-year-old prince had actually just slapped a 15-year-old boy and challenged him to a duel. But duels were technically outlawed in society, and at this point were so antiquated and anachronistic that many of the guests snickered in the background at Julius' behavior. But the man was so outraged he had not caught this. Still, to have the nerve to challenge another man to a duel in front of the Kaiser. Some people's opinions of Julian were that he most certainly did not lack courage. Bruno would normally like to settle a matter such as this with diplomacy. After all, angering a prince, even one from a minor state like Julius was a bad idea. But when he saw Clara's vicious expression in the background, Bruno immediately knew what had happened. The princess had gotten drunk and said something about what happened five years ago to her husband. Bruno had one option now appeal to authority, and hopefully the Kaiser would break this rabble apart before any serious injury was done to either party. Or make an enemy of both Julius, and by extension his father-in-law, who himself was seething in the background. But the fury in Gustav's eyes was not aimed towards Bruno, who he had settled this matter years ago when it had first occurred. Rather, his wrath was directed towards his errant daughter who had revealed something that could have a very negative effect not only on her own family and upbringing, but on that of the prince she was married to. Ultimately, Bruno decided not to back down, and instead appealed to the authority of the Kaiser who was watching the developments with great interest, while those around him whispered about the audacity of what was happening. Though I don't know what I have done to offend you. If you challenge me here in front of so many witnesses, you are compelling me to accept your offer. That is, of course, if the Kaiser would permit something as roguish as a duel. The reality of the situation was that the honor of the woman in question being fought over was not that of the Princess Clara, but rather of the bastard girl known as Heidi Krieger. After all, this whole ordeal started because Bruno dared to defend her against her older half-sister's attempted abuse. Few people knew this, but for those who did, it was something they did not want to become public. And because of this, Heidi tried to get Bruno to stop before the Kaiser could respond. My lord, you don't need to do this. There is no need for you to risk injury for the sake of someone like me. Bruno had a stern expression as he eyed Prince Julius, but when he turned around and responded to Heidi's concerns, it was one of nothing but warmth. He patted the girl's head in front of everyone, while assuring her that he was happy to defend her honor. 
Do you think I fear a half-wit who so brazenly challenges a teenage boy to a duel despite not knowing the full circumstances behind his petty rage? I would be honored to take up the sword on behalf of your honor, my lady. The crowd began to whisper among themselves regarding all kinds of things. Despite being a bastard, Bruna had referred to Heidi as my lady which was wholly inappropriate to do so, as such a term implied noble status. Second, he said he was taking up this duel on behalf of her honor, but the prince had challenged Bruno on behalf of his wife's honor who was the Princess Clara von Bentheim Tecklenburg who Bruno had apparently laid his hands on. After a brief spread of rumors, people quickly realized Heidi was Clara's half-sister, and that Bruno had likely offended the princess on the girl's behalf at some unknown time and place. Needless to say, Julius was confused by this development as it was nothing like his wife had told him. As for the Kaiser, he was sufficiently inebriated to have taken an interest in this plot development. Sure a duel would not exactly be legal in this day and age. But as long as it wasn't to the death, then wouldn't it just be a nice display of fencing for his guests? It was, after all his beloved daughter's second birthday, and what better way to honor the girl than by having two men fight at her celebration? Because of this, the Kaiser broke out into applause, stealing everyone's attention away from the drama as he gave permission for the duel to be held here and now in his home. Wonderful. Simply wonderful. The passionate display of youth. It's a perfect scene for us all to enjoy, isn't it? Though a duel to the death would most certainly violate the law. I would not be above permitting a fencing exhibition between the two of you. Would you two young gentlemen perhaps be interested in a bit of Mensa? The winner, of course, will be determined by whoever yields first. So how about it? Bruno sighed heavily. He realized that he should not have expected the Kaiser who had been known in his past life for having fanciful thoughts towards war, and chivalry to prevent this duel from taking place. And realizing that he had no other chosy, Bruno was quick to accept the offer with a respectful bow. My Kaiser. It would be my honor to perform about a fencing with the prince here as an honorable display for your daughter's second birthday. Prince Julius had a smug smirk on his face. This boy wanted to beat him in a bout of fencing? He himself was a regional Mensa champion. What could a mere child have in comparison to his skills? With the Kaiser's permission, the two men were handed swords of the epee variety. This was not your standard epee of modern sport fencing. Its blade was sharp and its point was intact. Normally, the fencers would be given a pair of protective goggles and some form of body armor. But in this case, only the swords were given. After all, this was a duel disguised as a fencing match. The ballroom floor was vacated with all parties other than the fencers gathered to the side, many of which had drinks in their hands as they made bets on who they thought would win the bout. As for the referee, it was the Chancellor himself. With the infamous Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck having retired a mere four years prior. This meant that the man acting as witness and referee for the duel was none other than Leo von Kaprovi, who made sure the two fences were aware of the rules before going at it. Heidi did not have the nerve to look and watch Bruno get hurt. She wanted desperately to look away and look back only for things to be perfectly normal. As if this duel was a mere fanciful thought. But something within her told her that it was her duty to watch the man she loved fight on behalf of her honor. And as embarrassed as she might be in that moment, so much so that she couldn't open her eyes and express her thoughts at the same time. She mustered the courage in that moment and shouted a sentiment that would not be forgotten by anyone who bore witness. You can do this, my love. I believe in you. Bruno was testing the balance of his blade when he heard this, while waiting for the duel to begin. His face became flustered as he heard the words my love so shamelessly be spoken by Heidi. It took him a second to recover, and when he did so, he chuckled and shook his head. His opponent was grimacing at Bruno's nonchalant nature. The boy was clearly not considering him to be a threat. And because of this, there was a gruff tone in his voice as questioned Bruno's actions. And what pray tell is so funny. Bruno sighed as he took a fencing stance with his epi, pointing the blade in the direction of his opponent. 
There was a confident expression on his face as he said the words that enraged his opponent. How can I possibly have the face when my lady expresses such love for me? With this, the bout began and before Julius even realized it, his torso had been pierced by his opponent. It was not a mortal wound, but the blade did indeed pierce the flesh and was quickly withdrawn. Julius and the crowd were in disbelief at how swiftly and skillfully Bruno had moved. Had it been a duel to first blood, then the bout would have been decided just as it had begun. But this duel would only end when one yielded. And the prince was a stubborn fool. He howled in pain like a pig that had been stuck by a spear, while screaming at Bruno for his attack. You little shit. You stabbed me? Bruno stared at his opponent as if he was an idiot before expressing this sentiment aloud. One that caused the entire crowd, except for Clara to break out into laughter. I mean honestly, your grace? What were you expecting? This is a duel, not a knitting competition. Now do you yield? Or do I need to poke a few more holes in you before you see reason? Julius was in disbelief. He was a regional Mensa champion. And yet this boy, this fifteen-year-old child, has struck him so swiftly? Where was his honor? Where was his face after enduring such an insult? He quickly thrusted his blade towards Bruno, and vicious at that, aiming for Bruno's eye in an attempt to blind him. But Bruno's reflexes were swift. Acting on mere impulse and muscle memory, he parried the blade, and struck the prince in the shoulder with another aggravating and piercing blow. Upon seeing the prince try to so grievously wound him, Bruno saw no point in showing mercy. At first he had decided to give the prince a fair fight, in order to maintain some face for his lofty title. But after witnessing the fool try to blind him for no reason, Bruno took off the kiddie gloves and increased the speed and intensity of his thrusts, piercing the man's body again and again and again, until his blood had seeped through his white dress shirt and stained it red. Yet time and again Julius would raise to attack Bruno only for his attempts to be quickly thwarted, resulting in another counter-attack that struck his body. There were so many holes in Julius Torso that he was now in danger of dying from blood loss, ultimately forcing the referee to step in and call an end to the contest. The Kaiser's libguard quickly restrained Julius who went out of control as he realized he had been completely and utterly humiliated in his attempt to protect his wife's honor and by a fifteen-year-old boy no less. This isn't over. So long as I can still breathe I will not yield. But the referee had called an end to the contest, no matter how much determination the prince may have, he lost. And was escorted to a proper clinic to treat his wounds, and rather forcefully by the Kaiser's libguard. After the fight was over, and his blade was returned to the Kaiser's staff, Heidi rushed over and hugged Bruno. There were tears in her eyes. She had clearly been very anxious while watching the duel. And she even searched Bruno for wounds. Yet there was not a mark on his flesh. Once she had finished, she cursed him out for being so foolish. You damn fool. I was so worried about you. Why would you do something so stupid? Bruno smirked and patted the girl's hair silky golden hair, before saying the first words that came to his head which he thought would make him look like a proper nobleman. For your honor, my lady? I would gladly give my life. Heidi was truly stunned into silence when she heard these words come from Bruno's mouth. Though Bruno didn't realize it, his nonchalant statement had actually reached the depths of the girl's heart. If she was already head over heels in love with the boy, she was now dedicated to being his dutiful wife for the rest of her life. She wiped the tears in her eyes and leaned in close, taking advantage of Bruno's embarrassment towards his own shameless statement to kiss him on the lips, thoroughly causing the boy's brain to melt down. Bruno stood there in silence as Heidi finished her peck on the lips, before she made a statement that would force Bruno to honor his remarks. I'll hold you to that promise. Contrary to what Bruno's father initially believed would happen following his son's duel with the Prince of Lip, the Kaiser was not at all offended by the boy's actions, and was actually quite pleased with his performance. Going out of his way to approach Bruno's father and establish ties with him. Because of this, Bruno's father and the Junker coalition would gain a significant amount of favor in the Reichstag's next election.
and in the coming years, Bruno's father would be appointed to the Bundesrat as he desired. Despite Prince Julius' grievous injuries, he did not perish, and instead made a full recovery. And though he wanted to take vengeance on Bruno for humiliating him to such a degree, his father condemned him in the most severe of terms, and made sure that the prince would not make any trouble. Another two years had passed in the blink of an eye. Bruno finished up his schooling without incident and applied for admission to the Royal Prussian Main Cadet Institute, with the personal recommendation of the Kaiser himself, who had begun keeping a close eye on Bruno ever since his performance on that fateful night. Bruno was accepted with ease into Prussia's foremost military academy for training new officers. Like most military academies, Bruno would be forced to live in the barracks meaning he would not be able to return home for some time. Because of this, he gathered his mother, father, and young fiancé Tilda Copyright E together in his home, where he said his temporary farewells, as he would not be able to see any of them until the holidays when they were granted leave. Both Elsa and Heidi were in tears, as they did not want to wait so long to see the boy, no, the young man, return from the academy. However, his father had a look of pride on his face, as he congratulated Bruno on getting admitted to the academy like his brothers had before him. Bruno, I had no doubt that someone of your talents would get accepted to the Royal Prussian Main Cadet Institute. Your talents are exceptional, perhaps even peerless among those your own age. But you will come to understand that your noble status means nothing where you are headed off to. Gone are the days where nobility gain esteemed positions in the military because of their heritage. The army is a place of pure meritocracy. You will gain your position when you earn it, but you must start out from the bottom like everyone else. I recommend that you do not behave poorly towards those of common birth, as they too will be alongside you as your fellow cadets. And it would be unwise to make enemies simply because our family has earned the honor of being called lords. Bruno naturally had no intentions of looking down upon commoners. He had never done so in this life, and the reason for that was simple. He still had memories of his past life where it was a near along after the monarchy and noble families had fallen from power and glory. Because of this, he had no such arrogance simply because his family was born into a higher social class. Thus, he nodded his head and assured his father he need not worry about such things. You don't need to fret over such matters, father. Since when have I ever treated someone poorly simply because they were a commoner? This assuring statement caused Bruno's further to smile and nod his head in agreement with his youngest son's remarks. Indeed, you are not like your brothers. Since a young age, you have had an air of wisdom and maturity that usually only comes with exceptional life experience. I do not worry about you in the slightest. Now. I believe you have two ladies waiting to say their farewells to you. Bruno shook his father's hand before turning to address his mother. Despite the fact that she was in her mid-forties, she looked as if she were ten years younger. She was crying profusely over the idea that her youngest son had finally become a man. No matter how much she tried to resist the urge to hug her youngest son, Elsa could not do so. She clung tightly to Bruno and made him promise that he would be okay. My baby boy is all grown up, and going off to the academy. Promise me, Bruno, that you will write to your mother every day. I want to hear how life is treating you in the army. If anyone dares bully you, you tell your mother and she will straighten them out real quick. Bruno had to force himself away from his mother's embrace. He had long since grown accustomed to her overprotective nature. But he would also never make a promise he couldn't fulfill. Because of this, he was quick to reject his mother's request, but assured her everything would be fine. Relax mother, it's not like I am going off to war. I'm simply attending a military institute of higher learning. I'll be fine. The woman tried to hug Bruno again, but he evaded with his cat-like reflexes. Meanwhile, his further patted the woman's shoulder and held her in place with his firm grip to ensure that she didn't try to keep the boy any longer. After all. There was another young woman who required Bruno's attention far more than his mother. Though she was only a bastard, and an unrecognized one at that, Bruno's father had long since grown accustomed to Heidi being a good match for his son.
and had even begun to refer to her as a young lady in private, despite her not being a noblewoman. Bruno gave his father a slight nod of approval before walking over to Heidi who, like his mother was crying. She had grown up even more since that ball two years ago. And was now physically mature, even if she was not yet legally an adult. Bruno wiped the tear from the young maiden's eyes with his finger. Before hugging her tightly, he assured the young woman that he would be back before she even realized it. Heidi, must you really cry over something like this? It will only be a few months before we see each other again. You're a grown woman now, one that I will one day be proud to call my wife. Surely you can wait for my return. After all, if I am ever called off to war, you will be required to wait much longer. There was no fear in Heidi's eyes when Bruno said one day he will be marching to war. Rather, she simply smiled and nodded her head, assuring him that she would faithfully await his return. I promise, I will wait until you come to find me. And in two years, we can finally be married. Bruno pat the young woman's silky golden hair, as he had often done in the past when they were children, and said goodbye while the family servants grabbed his trunks and escorted them out the front door to the automobile. This is goodbye for now, Heidi. I will see you in a few months. After saying this, Bruno walked out the door of his family's manor, which had been his home since his reincarnation into this era. He did not take a second to look back, fully embracing his future, one which he hoped would allow him to lead Germany to victory in the coming century so that the past mistakes of his previous life could be thoroughly rewritten. Upon arrival at the Royal Prussian Main Cadet Institute found himself lined up with all the other cadets, as a drill instructor barked commands at them. As someone who had previously undergone a similar experience in his past life, Bruno was well accustomed to such harshness. After basic orientation, Bruno was forced to change into his cadet uniform along with all others, and was escorted to the barracks where he met with several other young men. The officer corps of the German army was filled with many men of noble blood. But there were also commoners among their ranks as well. The young man who had the bottom bunk that was shared with Bruno had been born into a wealthy merchant family, albeit one without any noble titles. After all, it was the age of industry, and because of this many commoners were wealthier than noblemen. But for whatever reason, either a lack of military gallantry, or a failure to provide to the Reich's scientific and cultural achievements, they remained as the status of commoners. Heinrich Koch, a man of such birth, was quick to introduce himself to his new bunk mate. The name is Heinrich Koch. It is a pleasure to meet you friend. And you are? Bruno smiled as he shook the man's hand. Like he had told his father. He held no contempt for the commoners, and if they were capable men, which one would have to be to attend this university, he would be happy to establish ties with them. Bruno von Zeitner, and the pleasure is all mine Heinrich. Heinrich's eyes widened when he heard this. His experience with nobles had been a mix of good and bad. Many were happy to exchange pleasantries to his face, but were more than willing to smear his reputation behind his back while other just openly looked down on him because of his family's commoner status. Because of this, he had developed a good judgment of character from a young age, and could usually tell when someone was sincere or not. And he could tell by a single exchange of names that Bruno was unlike most nobles he had met. Because of this, he was quick to comment on this. A young lord without an unearned sense of ego? Well, that's refreshing. I wonder. What kind of family did you grow up in to have such a humble attitude? Bruno chuckled when he heard this and began to speak of his family's background. They were a recently established house, one which earned their nobility through blood and iron in the Napoleonic Wars, and one who raised their sons to be soldiers. Because of this, he had grown up with a sense of duty to the Reich and its people, as well as a more humble attitude. When Bruno explained all of this, the man nodded his head, fully understanding why he was not like the others. Unfortunately, one of the other noblemen within the barracks overheard him and was quick to approach Bruno. After all, he had made quite a name for himself after besting Prince Julius two years prior, and nobles seemed to have long memories. Hold on a second. 
Did I hear you correctly? Bruno von Zeigner, as in the guy who bested Prince Julius von Lipp in a duel of honor? That's you? Bruno looked over at the man who said this and was quick to confirm he was indeed that man. That's correct. Although it was really just a glorified fencing match. Why do you ask? The young nobleman was quick to push Heinrich aside and introduce himself, which was something that Bruno found distasteful. I have heard a lot about you. They say you're a peerless genius among those your own age. Although, I have been known to be something of a genius myself. I look forward to competing with you. Bruno looked at the man with an odd expression. Almost as if he was looking at an idiot who self-proclaimed himself to be more intelligent than he actually was. Which was something commonly found among stupid people. And because of this, he leaned over and whispered to Heinrich, inquiring just who this young man was. I'm sorry. Who is this guy supposed to be? Heinrich sighed. He was well aware of who this man was. He was infamous for abusing his privilege as a nobleman, and that of his father who was in the Reichstag. That is Eric von Humboldt. He thinks he is some kind of prodigy. But in reality he is a bit of a dullard. The only reason he is here is because his father intervened on his behalf and pulled some strings. Normally that isn't supposed to happen, but when your father is in the Reichstag, certain shady deals can be made behind the scenes. Bruno was curious about this. He had earned his place in this school, what with his unapparelled academics, as well as the fact that he earned the Kaiser's favour through chivalric action who was more than happy to write a letter of recommendation on his behalf. But that was the extent of the help he received from the Kaiser. Kaiser Wilhelm II was not willing to personally pull strings to get Bruno admitted, as the relationship between the Kaiser and Bruno's father was not that deep. Nor did Bruno or his father ask such a massive favor. It was these kinds of people who Bruno despised. But he did not say anything to Eric. Because he figured that a guy like him would wash out of the academy in a few weeks, maybe a few months at the top. And so Bruno's life in the Royal Prussian Main Cadet Institute. It was a place where lifetime friendships would be forged. And where Bruno himself would earn his place as an officer in the Imperial German Army. Chapter 10, A Day Long Awaited. Idiaris's inverted question mark life in the academy was tough, but fair. It was no walk in the park, but because Bruno already had experience in this regard from his past life, he was more than capable of fulfilling what was required of him. In fact, he excelled where others had lagged behind. Even the drill instructors could not help but express surprise at Bruno's ability to complete the tasks required of him. Despite having no formal military training, the boy could march, salute, run, and shoot with the best of them. On top of this, Bruno performed with the highest marks in all subjects, whether it was strategy, tactics, mathematics, science, history etc. He had demonstrated a clear mastery of all. In addition to this, Bruno appeared to be quite innovative and forward-thinking when it came to the subject of grand strategy. Gaining praise from all of his instructors for his revolutionary use of tactics within war games. In the three years that Bruno spent in the academy, he had grown close to two of his fellow cadets. Heinrich Koch, and surprisingly the arrogant young nobleman Eric von Humboldt. As Bruno had anticipated, Eric had a hell of a first week at the academy. Growing up as a pampered nobleman. Eric was in no shape to perform the physical tasks required of them as army cadets. But through sheer perseverance, he had survived, and somehow managed not to get cut from the roster. As a result, he became much more humble and realistic about his own limitations. Going so far as to begin approaching those who excelled in various fields searching for their guidance. This was an admirable quality which attracted Bruno's attention. Eric would ultimately improve his performance over the first semester, to the point where Bruno had no problem including him into his study group, as the man had actually turned out to be a hidden talent he could make use of in the future. Today was the day before Bruno's wedding day. Heidi had just turned 18 a few weeks prior. Whereas Bruno was 20 years old at this very moment, he would be granted a day of leave from the academy to attend his wedding. But that would only happen tomorrow. For today, he was still at the academy. 
currently discussing the ongoing geopolitical situation among his two friends, Heinrich and Eric. The Kaiser challenges the British Navy on the seas. This naval arms race is destined to cause conflict between our two great nations, and if handled poorly, will result in a war on a scale which will cost the lives of tens of millions of men on both sides. But it may very well be a decade and a half before such a war breaks out. My immediate concern is the outbreak of war within King China. As we speak, the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, or the Boxer Movement, as we more commonly refer to them as, have gained considerable size and strength. The Boxers are an anti-imperialist and xenophobic movement which seeks to expel all non-Chinese from the nation by force. They have already attacked our missionaries and merchants. At their current rate of aggression, it is only a matter of time before they grow bolder. Their slogan is quite literally kill the foreigners, slaughter the followers of the foreign devils. If they are allowed to continue to gain power and the Qing dynasty chooses to support them even further, then I fear the end result will be military intervention. I give it a year at most before such a thing occurs if things continue to progress like this. Now, the Chinese may be a few decades behind us in terms of military technology, but they have made great strides towards modernization these past few years. Because of this, they should not be underestimated under any circumstances. Such a thing could lead to a humiliating defeat. It is because of this I intend to volunteer for the East Asian Expeditionary Corps the moment I graduate from this academy. Which should be just in time to get comfortable with my new unit before we deploy to northern China to put down the Boxer Rebellion. Matters in China were far away on the eastern side of the world. Few cadets cared to actually bother themselves with learning of such matters. But Bruno would have a thorough conversation with his fellow cadets about the subject educating them on the importance the region had towards the future. By the end of the discussion, both Heinrich and Derek seemed eager to take part in the war alongside Bruno. With Heinrich being the first to voice his agreement to volunteer for the East Asian Expeditionary Corps as well. Fuck it, why the hell not? What's the point of joining the army if you don't actually get to see battle? Besides, I hear China is an ancient and mystical place full of many beautiful women, it would be a shame not to visit at least once in my life. Eric nodded his head in agreement with this statement. With their performance in the academy, they would likely be given priority to wherever they desired to serve. And China sounded like it would be a good place to gain some proper combat experience. Especially if Bruno was so confident that war was about to erupt in the region. As for Bruno. He smirked before responding to Heinrich's comment about beautiful Chinese women. I'll leave the local ladies to you too. I'm a married man as of tomorrow. And I don't intend to take a mistress. Heinrich immediately patted Bruno's back and commented on his situation as if it was something undesirable. That is the one thing I do not envy about you nobles. Imagine getting married upon reaching adulthood. Where is your opportunity to live and have fun? Bruno however shook his head. He had experienced quite a bit of fun in his youth during his past life. But his greatest regret as he got older was never getting married or having any children. He would not ruin such a valuable opportunity given to him in this life by entertaining in such hedonism. Because of this, he shook his head and sighed, sounding like an old man as he lectured Heinrich on his words. You will understand when you're older. Both Heinrich and Derek broke out into laughter when they heard this, mocking Bruno for his words. What do you mean when we're older? You're the youngest cadet in our year. Mr. I graduated from high school a year earlier than everyone else. With that, Bruno would continue to have fun with his friends before going back to his studies for the day. He would have a long and peaceful sleep that night, because the next day he would be getting married. Bruno was up bright and early the next morning. He was transported to his family's estate where he would prepare for the wedding, which was being held later that day at a church in Berlin. As a Prussian his family were Protestants, not that Bruno cared for religion at all. Still, the entire family had gathered. And not just his father, mother, and siblings. But all of his uncles, aunts and cousins as well. In addition to this, Heidi's mother was present. 
As for her father, and half-siblings, none of them dared show up at a bastard's wedding. Heidi had never been legitimized, and thus, for them to show up to her wedding would be some kind of recognition that she was a von Bentham Tekelenberg, which she was not. Because of this, the girl was walked down the aisle not by her father, but by Bruno's father, who had in many ways been more of a father to the girl in her youth, than her own. Bruno stood at the altar, dressed in the most luxurious tailcoat tuxedo of the era. While Heidi walked down the aisle to the sound of the music, with a bouquet of white roses in her hands. Wearing a Victorian style wedding dress that was suitable for a princess. All the while her hair was one more tied up in an elegant bun. Even Bruno's breath was stolen away when she approached the altar, and the veil over her head was removed. Throughout the past three years at the military academy, he had seldom seen the girl, only on holidays. But whenever they did see one another, it was a warm and loving atmosphere. He had to admit, now that she was eighteen, and they were about to get married, that over the past fifteen years of being childhood friends, he had fallen under the woman's spell. And because of this, Bruno simply smiled, and made a whisper towards his young bride while the Lutheran priest was going through the motions, preparing his long-winded speech before. The vows could finally be said. You look absolutely stunning. I am truly at a loss for words. Heidi smiled, and blushed, trying not to make it obvious that she was speaking to Bruno while the priest was continuing with the traditional wedding speech. She couldn't help but make a comment about Bruno's appearance. Albeit far more light-hearted. You don't look so bad yourself. Eventually, the part where the priest asked about the vows game. Where the young couple both said the words I do before being granted to kiss one another. Where Bruno approached his young bride and held her tightly in his arms, placing a wholesome kiss on her lips, and thus sealing their marriage as husband and wife from this day forward, until final days. The wedding reception was held in Bruno's family home. For the time being as a cadet, Bruno did not have his own home as he was living in the barracks. But that would change shortly after he graduated. Or so he thought. But during the night of festivities, drinking, feasting, and plenty of gifts to the newly married couple. Bruno's father approached him and took him aside. He wanted to have a few words with the boy in private. The two of them entered the balcony of the family's estate, where the light of a full moon was high in the air. Bruno figured his father was going to say something about how proud he was, like he had done the day he entered the military academy. But instead, the man surprised him by trussing him a set of keys. Bruno's heightened reflexes caught the keys, where he stared at them with curiosity. That is until the old man finally spoke up and revealed what they unlocked. Those are yours now. I recently purchased this old manor, not far from the nearest military base. It's a quaint little home, one that has been thoroughly renovated to make use of all the modern technology that the two of you have grown up with. You and Heidi can make it your home as you build your family together. Consider it my wedding gift to you, son. Bruno was surprised that his father had bought him an entire house. But only for a second. When he thought about it, he realized the cost of such a home was a drop in the hat compared to his family's wealth. They were quite wealthy, more than enough to afford such an expensive present as a wedding gift. But, still, Bruno had yet to reveal to his father his plans to go to war and he was quick to do so as he felt guilty about owning a house he would not have the luxury to spend much time in. Father, this is more than I could ever ask of you. But when I graduate I intend to volunteer to the East Asian Expeditionary Corps. I won't be home outside those few weeks of leave I am granted each year. At least not for the first two years of my service. After that, I'll request a transfer back to Berlin. Don't you think it would be cruel to ask Heidi to live in such a home by herself? Bruno's father was naturally surprised by what his son had said, but he was not ignorant of the ongoings in China. He, too, was certain that Germany would be deploying troops to the region within a year's time. And because of this, he was quick to ask his son if he understood exactly what he was getting himself into. Bruno, you are aware of what's going on in China right now, yes? 
Are you really going to go off to war so soon after graduating from the academy? Bruno's father naturally knew about war and its horrors. He had earned an Iron Cross in the Franco-Prussian War. He had also fought in the Austro-Prussian War a mere five years prior. So he was more than experienced enough with battle to understand what Bruno himself was walking into. But Bruno's confidence was more than enough to quell the man's fears. As the young man was quick to announce that he was not so foolish as to underestimate the enemy. Contrary to popular belief, the enemy are not savages. They are quite advanced, and though victory is certain should the right go to war in China, let alone alongside the other great powers, we will still need capable officers if we wish to mitigate our losses. I am confident enough in my own ability to lead men into battle. And besides, my generation has yet to earn any honor or glory for our house on the battlefield. Wouldn't it be poetic that it was the youngest of us who first did so? Bruno's father sighed heavily and shook his head. He looked up at the stars and thought to himself for a few moments before finally responding. You're a man now, so you have a right to choose your own future. If you wish to go off to China and fight for our family and nation, then that is your right. But regardless, I still think it would be best if you and Heidi moved into the house. It's close enough to the nearest military base so that when you do finally transfer back home, you will be well within your rights to live there as an active duty officer. And the house is small enough that your wife will be able to take care of it by herself. Although if she does wish for servants, I can spare the expense. Now I have held you up enough. It's your wedding night. And I think it's time you and your bride spent some proper time alone together. After all, tomorrow you have to be back at the academy. So go, enjoy yourself while you can. Bruno smiled and nodded towards his father, stashing the key to his new manor away in his pocket, before running off to regroup with Heidi. They would continue to enjoy the festivities before retiring for the night together for the first time as husband and wife.